Okay, and um, just checking that you're seeing full screen and not notes. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to um, speak at the symposium. I think my work is going to be um, a bit um, more peripherally related to a lot of the work that's being discussed today because I work more on the application side of optical sensing and um, how it's applied for digital biomarker discovery. So I like to usually start out these talks by revisiting this idea of what a biomarker is and what we tend to use them for. So broadly, when we think about biomarkers, we think about kind of two major overarching principles. One is a diagnostic capability where we use a biomarker as an intermediate tracker of disease or to track treatment progress. On the other hand, we can also use a newly discovered biomarker to uncover new mechanisms behind uh, diseases, phenotypes, biological functions, and possibly even to develop putative drug targets. So when I talk about a digital biomarker, I'm talking about the same context of the use of a biomarker, but using data that's collected from a sensor. So specifically, the way that I define a digital biomarker is that this is digitally collected data. So for example, heart rate from a vital sign monitor, or in the case that we'll be talking about today, using photoplasmography, at where we transform that continuous signal into an indicator of health outcomes. So an example of that health outcome may be a chronic disease like prediabetes, or maybe a more acute disease like a respiratory infection. So the way that we actually design these digital biomarkers mathematically is that we develop some model where we have our target outcomes that are these more common clinical measurements. Maybe these are measurements that exist in an electronic health record, survey data, illness events that are reported um, by study participants or by patients. And we predict these as a function of these continuous signals. And a lot of these continuous signals are optical signals. And so that's the relation between this digital biomarker work and today's symposium. So I'll focus quite a bit today on our heart rate measurements that are taken optically from consumer wearable devices. And I'll also mention a bit about newer um, technologies to collect, to, to collect pulse ox or blood oxygen saturation measurements using consumer technologies as well, which has become really relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll mention more broadly also other areas where we're using this mix of digital signals, including optical signals, to develop digital biomarkers across a variety of realms. So running all the way from uh, women's health studies and analyzing the risk of preterm birth, where we actually used optical sensing technologies to uncover um, tissue reconstruction during pregnancy and to understand how that could be an indicator for preterm birth, all the way to understanding circadian disruption through measurements throughout the day and night of these, these various biosignals. And so there's a lot that we're doing again on the infection detection. And the, the next slide that I'll show will actually talk a bit more specifically about some of that infection detection work. Um, so we've been running this study out of my lab for uh, roughly the last uh, two years. Um, the study is called Cove Identify, and the idea there was that we are collecting these digital biomarkers or these signals from consumer wearable devices on a large population to try to answer two questions. One of these questions is who should be quarantined or tested and when? So is there a way that we can actually tell who's at a high risk of having a COVID-19 infection from their smartwatch data? And the second question was, are we able to detect who might need specialized care resources and when? So can we actually predict who's going to get worse from today's data? And there are a lot of more specific questions that we can ask here. But at the basis of all of these models that, that you know, these are the outcome variables that we're looking at are input signals that come from a combination of optical um, and motion and um, electrical sensors. 
So we're bringing this data together to try to answer these different questions. And I won't have time today to present the detailed work in that area because I really do wanna focus more on the underlying sensing technologies as that's more relevant to this crowd. So I'll talk a little bit about the technologies that we're using. We broadly refer to these technologies as biomets or biometric monitoring technologies. And the way that we define these is a connected digital medicine tool that processes data captured by a mobile sensor using algorithms to generate measures of behavioral or physiologic function. Now, this is a really kind of wordy definition, but the key points here are that we have some sensor and on top of that sensor, we have software and firmware. And those change the data in some ways that's important for us to account for. So if we take a look at a consumer wearable device, for example, an Apple Watch here, where we're looking at one of these underlying sensors, um, we'll take the example of an accelerometer here. You could easily envision that this could also be the optical sensor um, on the back of, of that Apple Watch, where you have some uh, physical parameter that you're measuring, whether that is um, light or whether that's physical motion, and that gets converted to an electrical signal. And there are a variety of layers of processing that occur on the device itself that change that signal from the primary physical property that we're trying to measure to something like a step count or a heartbeat. And with all of these layers of processing, that signal changes. And so this is something that's actually really important for us to note in the digital biomarker development realm, because our primary signal that we are interested in changes quite a bit through this process. And we don't always know what's going on under the hood in these commercial devices, where we don't have access to a lot of the details of the firmware and software. So we have to make some guesses as to what's going on. And this becomes pretty important when we think about the implications for how these measurements are used in the real world. So one of the projects that I want to focus on here is the project in looking at heart rate measurements from smartwatches. So the way that we obtain these heart rate measurements from smartwatches is through optical sensing. We have a light emitter like an LED of some kind, and oftentimes these are focused to certain wavelengths that are more optimal for um, measuring differences in oxy and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And essentially this light is passed underneath the skin, reflected back and detected through some sort of uh, photodiode light detector. And that difference uh, with the, the, the pulse cycles tells us the heart rate. So it's a, it's a very simple technology and um, you know, it's, it's generally quite easy to detect these changes in the pulse cycles that indicate when a heartbeat has occurred, but there are some challenges there as well. And you know, one of the major challenges is this trade-off between motion artifacts from using these, um, these sensing methodologies and ensuring that what we expect to be absorbing this light is actually what's absorbing this light. So I want to mention a couple of the challenges that we have in trying to get accurate heart rate measurements using these optical technologies. And one of the most common issues here is detection across diverse skin types, because typically the, the um, wavelengths that we're using on these consumer wearables is the green wavelength of light. So if you look at the older versions of the Apple Watches and Fitbits and the newer versions, you may notice that there are a different number of LEDs and a different number of sensors underneath the face. And lately, more of those have red and infrared sensing in addition to the green sensor, which initially was the only kind of sensor used. And the idea there is that um, the green wavelength of light is also absorbed by melanin, which is increased in people with darker skin tones. So you actually have a much more difficult time reading these optical sensing um, technologies in people with darker skin. So there's a balance here because the green wavelength of light is more accurate for addressing the motion artifacts and the red wavelength of light is more effective for looking across diverse skin tones. 
So what we've been looking at is this combination of tuning hardware and software so that under all circumstances and for all people, these technologies can be accurate. And I had a very talented PhD student, Brene Bent, who ran a study for us looking at a variety of consumer grade smartwatches, as well as research grade smartwatches, looking across a variety of skin tones, across a variety of um, activity circumstances, and comparing with clinical ground truth for heart rate measurement accuracy. And what we found was that counter to a lot of the reports that these smartwatches were not working as well as expected in people of darker skin tones, we actually did not see a change in accuracy there. If you actually build this device in the lab using a Raspberry Pi and just a green LED, you can see that there are differences in accuracy. So this indicates that there is this layer of firmware and software that's been used to uh, address some of these issues. And we've seen both past and current issues with these smartwatch devices actually having overheating issues where batteries get tuned up and down and LED intensities get tuned up and down. And we think one of the issues that's going on here is trying to account for these differences in skin tone. And so that's something that remains to be explored in our future studies. But what is really interesting to see is that another expectation that we had was that there was the strong decrease in accuracy during physical activity. And you can see that here, if we're looking at the uh, mean absolute error in this figure A, or the mean directional error in this figure B, we can see that in general, when we compare the green rest to the red activity levels, we have this increase in error um, in, in these wearable device measurements. And so what's important to think about here is the circumstances of use. So in general, in uh, people who are trying to use these to monitor their exercise activities and um, understand how, uh, how exercise may be impacting their heart rate and keeping them in target heart rate zones, um, we have higher inaccuracies due to the optical principles of the movement of the watch face on the skin. And we can see that in general, the activity um, heart rate tends to be overestimated. And so we think that this is a correction that a lot of these companies are doing as a way to prevent people from going into these very high heart rate zones. But again, there, this layer of firmware that's on top is really not correcting the hardware problems. So one other issue that I wanna to touch upon here that is very relevant today is the use of these same sorts of technologies for pulse oximetry, for measuring um, blood oxygen saturation levels. And the principles of this are quite similar to what we've seen with the heart rate measurements. Um, in this case, rather than looking at um, just the pulsatile changes, we're looking at both a DC or sort of analogous to a direct current um, waveform as well as an alternating current. So that is, again, that pulsatile signal. And we can use the difference between those with um, some mathematical transformation to get an estimate of the uh, blood oxygen saturation. And one of the things that recently came out during the COVID-19 pandemic was that there is this difference that's seen in the effectiveness of in-hospital pulse ox technologies that are optically based um, for detecting differences in, in um, blood oxygen saturation in black and white people. And so this is something that we're studying in a lot more detail now, analogously to the previous study that I showed, because also during the pandemic, there were multiple consumer smartwatch companies that released pulse oximetry measurement technologies using the existing LEDs on the smartwatches. Um, so Garmin, Fitbit, Apple Watch were just three examples of companies that widely rolled out this sort of technology, and it really, uh, you know, needs to be vetted. And so I want to um, actually skip ahead here to a slide just to, to talk about when we're, when we're thinking about these biometric monitoring technologies and digital biomarkers, we have to be quite careful in understanding how consumer devices are validated versus clinical devices. So when we see that things are clinically validated, we really need to have a careful eye. There's a lot that goes on under the hood of these devices from the, the, the transformations of data throughout what we'll call 
this data supply chain to uh, a lack of verification and validation. And we've been working with the Digital Medicine Society to better develop methods to address these existing challenges um, so that we can be sure that technologies that purport to accurately measure heart rate or pulse oxygen saturation using these optical technologies will in fact work for everyone. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and stop here. And um, again, thank you for, for inviting me to give this talk and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.